To get us started, <laughs> I want you to imagine doing something for the first time. Specifically, I want you to imagine the first time you learned how to drive a car. Okay. Maybe you were prepared for it. Uh, maybe your parents said, hey, on Tuesday, we're going to go out and we're going to give you a chance to drive. Or maybe they just pulled into a parking lot and threw the keys at you and you just jumped in. But we live in Nebraska, so it's more likely a country road your parents stopped on and gave you the keys. <laughs> so I want you to remember that feeling. The excitement, the butterflies, the anticipation, the worry. Whether we like it or not, those are all ah, <laughs> symptoms of stress. It's a good stress, though. It is uh, called eustress. And for the most part, learning to drive is a good type of stress, right? It's one that we look forward to. It's a, it's a passage, okay? And that doesn't necessarily have to deal with first-generation students, but I want you to try another analogy for me. All right. Now imagine heading off to college. Imagine, if this was not your experience, <laughs> that you're the first in your family to go. Your parents try to help prepare you, but they haven't experienced enrolling in classes or applying for financial aid. They try to be helpful, but they're just as worried and just as nervous as you are. Going to college is a, is a new experience for the whole entire family. There's so much pressure to be the first person in your family to go to college. And maybe your family is not supportive of that. Maybe they've tried to encourage you not to go. Or maybe you feel guilty leaving your loved ones at home. Maybe your parents or guardians just dropped you at the door and said goodbye. And I know that happens, unfortunately. So imagine, or maybe you've experienced that stress. Surely there are people out there who don't experience that stress, uh, <clears throat> just like I described. And some maybe feel it more than others. So when I set out to do my dissertation, I knew that I wanted it to be about stress. Stress is a huge part of my life, um, as it is probably all of ours. Like Sean said, I'm a mom, I'm a wife. Um, I was getting my dissertation, you know, uh, having a baby during a pandemic. It's, it's a big part of all my life. Um, <clears throat> Some other stressful things that might have happened to me is, so like during the night, I grind my teeth so hard that I've broken um, some teeth and had to have root canals, which surprisingly, uh, if you were a dentist during COVID, you made bank because oh. cracked teeth, broken teeth, root canals, they were on the rise during COVID. So um, that tells you a little bit about stress. Um, I once had a, had a tension headache so bad that I thought I was having a brain aneurysm. And I went to the doctor and they were like, all right, so is anything bothering you? Do you have any stress in your life? <laughs> and funny, I just had a root canal right before that. So I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so tension headache is, is stress related. And so once I kind of learned that, uh, it made a lot of sense. And stress kind of became something that um, I became really in tune to. And I teach health and wellness classes. I teach essential studies. And so all of those classes really do have a health component. And in an assignment that I was giving to my students, it was rarely that I had someone tell me that they were not stressed. That was the number one factor with all of these students um, when looking at an entire health assessment that they had to take. So um, that's anecdotal data. <clears throat> what I can share with you is some statistical information about stress in college students. So <clears throat> in the American College Health Association National College Health Assessment, the Acha Nacha for short, <laughs> um, some stats from 2018. So 44.6% of college students said that they had more than an average stress. 86% uh, of college students felt overwhelmed by all they had to do in the last 12 months. And this was in 2018. So the survey changed just a little bit uh, in the subsequent years, but more recently, 49.6% of students rated their stress levels as moderate in the fall of 2020. 48.8% um, rated as moderate in fall 2019. So we had a little increase in the fall of 2020. Um, and then it went down in the spring of 2021. So down to 48, which seems like a great thing, right? Like our moderate stress is going down. 
but that's not so great because actually students who rated their stress as high in spring 2021 went from 24.9 the year before to 32.8% of students. So while our moderate is kind of going down, our high is going up. And those are post-pandemic results. <laughs> Studying stress in college students uh, is done very often. Right? We have the achinache twice a year. Um, we get that information a lot. And so it was up to me in my process to find a gap in the literature. <clears throat> I really resonate with first-generation college students. I was a first-generation, well, I am first-generation college student. Um, so, you know, I never really realized that I was a first gen until I became an instructor here at Shadron State. It wasn't something that was a big part of my experience, but, you know, when I was going to college, all of my peers were first gens too. And so we all kind of were in that whole thing together. Um, when I was at, I believe it was like a campus fair. Jen Cher had this list in front of her table and she's like, hey, are you a first gen student? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, write your name down. We're gonna get a bunch of like first gen faculty and staff around here um, to help support first gen students. And I was like, that's so awesome. And kind of like made me take a little pride in that um, and kind of own that I was a first gen student. So <laughs> first generation students make up 20 to 50% of the college population. And I know that's a huge range. Um, the definition that I use specifically for my study is uh, that, ha that you have no parents that went to a f uh, higher education of, of any kind. Um, there is another definition that says um, your parents maybe went to an associate's college, got an associate's degree, or maybe they did some college. And so 50%, that's where your parents had a little bit of college, um, but didn't complete. And about 20% of the entire college population are first generation students where their parents did not go to college of any kind, okay? Uh, in the research, we found that first generation students are more likely to experience stress for a variety of reasons. Um, they are also more likely to be lower income, more likely to be minorities, um, more likely to use financial aid. <laughs> and so all of those things together, uh, lower income, more financial aid, they also need to prioritize having a job during college, which adds more stress onto their plate. Uh, they tend to struggle more with adjustment to college and they have to rely more on institutional supports. And there's a lot of institutional support in the crowd right now, so I know you guys know what I'm saying. Uh, so yes, college students are going to be stressed, but if we are running a race, first-gen students are always a few steps behind their continuing generation peers. So I wondered, with being a first-gen and having all the stress in my life, uh, if there was a way that we could figure out how to bridge that gap between first gen and continuing generation students and kind of get them on a level playing field when it comes to stress. <laughs> so my research questions, uh, number one, is there a relationship between perceived stress, self-esteem, social support, locus of control, and coping strategies in first generation college students? So I started with stress and then we looked at all of these other factors that have some uh, role in uh, first generation students uh, in their experiences in college. And then the second question, so first I had to see if all of those were related to each other, or, you know, had a correlation. The second thing is, uh, do self-esteem, social support, locus of control, and coping strategies predict perceived stress in first generation college students, okay? So after I found out if they were related, I wanted to find out if we could predict, if one factor could predict higher levels of stress or lower levels of stress in students. <clears throat> so these traits to me stood out for a variety of reasons. Uh, Self-esteem was found to be the single most important predictor of well-being in first-generation students. If you think about um, students who have a high level of self-esteem, they're go-getters, just naturally. They like to ask questions, they're not afraid to ask questions, um, which you know, is, is something to help people succeed. Locus of control, that is uh, how we define um, who or what has control over our lives. So specifically, I looked at uh, internal locus of control, so kind of having an internal motivation, powerful others, and chance, or leaving it up to luck. Studies found students who attributed life events to chance had more severe stress 
than those who scored high on the internal or powerful other scale. Um, and academic stress is actually found to be lower in students with an internal locus of control, um, which makes sense that students are intrinsically motivated. Um, they're more you know, ready to go with that. <clears throat> with coping strategies, I use three different coping strategies. Um, proactive, so with this, when students are stressed, they're more likely to set goals, uh, focus on positive self-talk, uh, reflective, where they directly address the problem, you know, maybe journal it, write it down, brainstorm ways to solve it. Um, <clears throat> and this has been found, reflective coping has been found to uh, have lower levels of stress in first generation students. Emotional support seeking, so this is when you disclose feelings to others, you try to evoke empathy, you seek companionship. So just being in kind of a social setting and letting uh, others help you. And then with social support, <clears throat> um, I didn't break it down into different types of social support. I just wanted to see if level of perceived social support uh, worked for that. <laughs> because social support, as we know, is a big factor uh, with first-gen students. So my study, I used a correlational research design. Um, I did a Pearson's correl correlation analysis. Don't ask me to talk about all this because I'm just here for the information. <laughs> I did this once and I'm like, all right, we're good. We're good. I understand this data specifically. <laughs> um, so I did a multiple regression analysis after that. Uh, in my study sample, I had 164 first-gen students. 75% uh, of my sample was women, 24.4 was men. Um, 0 0.6 decided or uh, did not prefer to answer. And then that is, it seems a little skewed in that sense, but in 2018, um, Shadron State's student population was 59% female and 41% male. So um, at first I was like, whoa, it's totally skewed, but it, it does kind of line up. Um, and I really enjoyed using Shadron State uh, for my sample. 45% of our uh, undergraduate pop population, or I guess 45% of our population was first-gen students. Um, and in 2020, first-gen students made up 41% of just the undergraduate class. So we have a high uh, number of first-gen students here. Um, in my study, uh, it ranged ages 18 to 23 plus. I ran out of options to give them, so 23 plus is, is anything above that. Uh, because of the age of majority law in Nebraska, I had to get parental permission for anyone under 18, which I was actually able to do. Uh, I attended a new student orientation and was able to get parents to um, allow their students to do it. And I did have a couple from that group. 47.6% um, of my study were juniors and seniors, and it was evenly between those two groups um, that chose to take it. All right, so the results. <clears throat> Yay, we had some good results. Yay. Um, perceived stress was related to all variables. So we did have a correlation there. Um, external locus of control. So uh, when you feel that life happens to you rather than due to you, um, had higher levels of perceived stress. So when we kind of think about that, you know, you leave things up to chance. You're just like, oh, whatever, we're just going to let it happen. That's a more stressful uh, way to live. Uh, higher levels of self-esteem were related to lower levels of perceived stress. So naturally, kind of what I assumed, people with uh, first-gen students with higher levels of self-esteem, um, lower levels of stress. And then emotional support seeking, so talking to others, knowing who you can talk to, finding people you can care about, uh, was a predictor of lower levels of stress. The strongest relationship demonstrated was between perceived stress and self-esteem. Um, <clears throat> First-gen students who had higher levels of self-esteem had lower levels of stress. And there was a study um, by Chung et al. who found self-esteem to increase over time in college, which I found really interesting that 46% of my sample was juniors and seniors, and it kind of relates to that. So it's likely that more of them um, since they were upper class when they had higher levels of self-esteem, as they found in that study. And then emotional support seeking coping was also found to be a significant predictor. Uh, so those who, like I said, sought out emotional support were likely to have lower levels of stress. And so I think that that shows uh, sometimes we just need an outlet, we just need to talk to people, um, and we need to be supported emotionally. 
all right, so conclusions from my study. Uh, what I found is that counseling services should be readily available on campus, and we all know this. Um, unfortunately, though, in a 2016 study of over 139 colleges, students seeking counseling services was more than five times the rate of institutional enrollment. So there's an increase in demand for counseling services, but there's not an increase in resources for those services. Um, I did a little research today to find out uh, what those numbers might be like post-pandemic. We're not really post-pandemic, but um, now that we're back in college. And I saw uh, Loyola <clears throat> in Chicago. They saw 6% of their student body within the first two weeks of class. So they had 6% make an appointment with their counseling center within the first two weeks. Um, <clears throat> Another conclusion I came to, and this uh, had to do with my theoretical framework, <clears throat> which was the social cognitive theory. Um, exposure and opportunity to engage in positive health behaviors are key factors in reduction of stress in first-gen students. So students are more likely to participate in these health behaviors and these health things if they see other people doing that as well. And this has been something that I've really tried to do with my students, um, being more open with them. You know, hey, I've experienced stress. Um, I've experienced anxiety. I have gone through these different things. And I remember just a handful of years ago, my first time I ever saw a counselor, I walked there so nobody would see my car in the parking lot because I was just like, I don't want people to know that I'm going here. Um, but being able to show your students that you are engaging in these positive health behaviors is really going to benefit them because when they see it, it puts them at ease and they're more willing to do those things as well. <clears throat> My final conclusion is that it is crucial that further studies of the unique stressors and coping patterns in this population be conducted so successful orientation, retention, and completion of first-gen students can improve. So <clears throat> after doing my entire dissertation, 84 pages I think is what it was, <laughs> 19,000 words is what I counted today, I took that entire thing and I put it down into a manuscript of like 5,000 words I think. <laughs> so I took that whole thing, moved it down, I know some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, and that actually, I submitted it for publication. Um, I submitted it on like March 15th, 2020, which is the same day the pandemic, I think, was declared. Um, but it was actually accepted for publication. And it is a published study in the Journal of um, Student Affairs, uh, Research and Practice. And there's a special health and wellness uh, edition that it was published in. So um, it's really exciting with that and then you know, we can maybe continue those studies and see how it affects first gens. But I have some tips for you now. All right, so we saw that self-esteem, you know, is one thing that helps relieve stress or helps lower stress. So <clears throat> here are some, some tips I have for you. Uh, number one, identify and challenge your negative beliefs. So a lot of times we have this belief that if we're not first, we're last. Or if we're not perfect, we're a failure. Um, we need to be able to kind of challenge those negative beliefs and say, you know what? That was the first time I did that. I should not expect to be perfect at it. You know, I I need to cut you know cut myself some slack uh, and not set my expectations too unrealistically. Uh, sometimes we also jump to conclusions. So you text somebody and they don't respond, and you're sitting there thinking. Oh my gosh, do they hate me? Did I say the wrong thing? Did I not do this? Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you need to kind of challenge those negative beliefs and, and recognize that, that maybe there is something else there um, and it's not, you know, don't take it personally. <laughs> you can also be positive, right? Yay, positivity, uh, but not too much. No toxic pos positivity, just regular positivity. Um, also, uh, so with this, I know there was like a speaker last week who, who had you guys doing some positive things. So I want to do that as well. Um, I want you to turn to somebody near you and tell them something positive about yourself. <laughs> you have something. Come on, something positive. 
What you got? <laughs> All right, you guys tell something positive. Look at those smiles on your face. That is so great. The energy in here is just, it's more positive now. Not, not too positive, not toxic, but it's positive. Um, all right, also uh, some advice to build your self-esteem is to cut yourself some slack. And this kind of goes with the, the first thing I said. So making sure that you're holding yourself to an appropriate standard, that you're not trying to be more than what you're capable of at any time. Um, <clears throat> you know, during all of the stressors that we are dealing with right now or throughout all these different things, um, we're taking on a lot more than we probably ever have. Um, you know, we've, we've made ourselves to be empathetic human beings more than ever, um, and we are listening to our students, and we are working with our students, um, and these things become a little bit more stressful. Maybe sometimes we aren't always able to take some time for ourselves, but we need to cut ourselves some slack, all right? You can, you can repeat this to my husband, but if, if I have an opportunity to sit on the couch and watch Grey's Anatomy versus unloading the dishwasher, sometimes I just need to watch Grey's Anatomy, all right? Um, so cut yourself some slack and do things that, that make you happy. Uh, take care of yourself physically. So when we feel good physically, that also helps to boost our self-esteem. Um, when we think you know, positively, how you guys are feeling now after thinking positive, um, when, we, when we feel good like that about ourselves, it can really help us to be confident. Um, <clears throat> as far as physical activity and how it relates to, uh, oh wait, I'll get into that in a second. All right, and the last thing I have uh, is set boundaries. So make sure that you say no to things. I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but also be sure to stand up for yourselves. Uh, as far as the people that you surround yourself with, if people bring you down constantly, say goodbye, all right? I know on Instagram I follow like a lot of mommy uh, accounts, right? Because they're funnier than me and I, I need some humor in my life. And I was trying to find one specifically, but I couldn't, so I just Googled it. And have you guys ever th seen those things where it's like, if someone says this, then you know, say goodbye. You don't need that kind of negativity in your life. <laughs> Have you guys seen that? And there was one that I found uh, that I thought was pretty funny, kept popping up. But if someone says you put too much Parmesan cheese on your pasta, stop talking to them. <laughs> you don't need that kind of negativity in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Guy at Olive Garden, it's like, keep going, keep going. Um, all right, so some tips for emotional support seeking. First things first, spend time with the people who make you happy. All right, surround yourself by the people that you enjoy being with. If you don't enjoy being with people, don't be with them, okay? I think it's not always as simple as that. <laughs> it's all that boundary setting. It's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, but do things that make you happy and spend time with people who make you happy. You don't need a huge network of people to do that. Uh, sometimes college students, I think, get hung up on I need to be part of this group or I need to be part of this group. And it's all about the quality, not the quantity, right? Uh, follow your interests. So finding things that you enjoy. Do you like volunteering? Do you like playing sports, um, doing clubs? Those different things. Find those things that really do make you happy uh, and find you know, your people in those groups. <clears throat> Connect with friends however you can. So. The technology that we have today is awesome for that. We have Zoom, we have Skype, we have FaceTime. You can actually see people. I see students walking in the hallway just staring into their phones, um, which is a little more distracting than when they have it like this. So I'm not sure that's like the best thing to do. Um, but <clears throat> it gives us a lot more opportunities now to connect in ways that we never could before. And then counseling services. This is one of the most important things uh, with emotional support seeking. And uh, counseling services are there for students for a variety of reasons. Um, it doesn't matter, there's no judgment. Counselors are fantastic, especially the ones that we have here. Specifically for first-gen students, uh, self-esteem, so with self-esteem, first-gens, meet with your advisor, right? We're your people. I imagine there'd be a lot of students here saying, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's right, that's right. Um, so meet with your advisor, come see us, we are your people. Uh, I know 
I've really made some great connections with my students, especially the first gen ones, and um, you know, not to single them out differently, but uh, it's really great just to kind of relate to those experiences when someone comes in and they're saying, you know, I, I don't want my family at graduation because you know, they might embarrass me or something because they've never been there before. And I'm like, I've been there, I've been there. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's nice to kind of walk through, to, through stu students through that. Um, and, you know, as a student, you never really know what your advisor has been through. So they can be helpful in many ways. Uh, know that no question is a dumb question. Sometimes, you know, our classrooms are really quiet and nobody's asking questions uh, because they're embarrassed or, you know, they, they aren't confident enough to uh, raise their hand. But I think everyone should know that no question really is a dumb question. <clears throat> um, and also talk to your professors. So becoming more comfortable allows you to have greater self-esteem, uh, really helps you to be successful on campus. All of your professors, all of the staff, everyone on campus, we all want students to succeed. I think we're all on the same boat here. Um, so I think it's really important that our students understand that. And then for emotional support seeking, uh, here on campus we have Project Strive, uh, or TRIO, kind of one and the same. Um, so you can, uh, if you are low income, if you are a first gen student, you can apply to be in those programs. They have a lot of uh, group activities that they do. They have a counselor specific um, to students in that program. And they really do a lot of stuff that helps support our first generation students. Um, there's also an initiative that they did a couple years ago where they, when they asked you if you were first gen, they got kind of a list of that, and then they gave out stickers that said, I'm first. Um, and so if you are a first gen uh, student and you wanna find people like you on campus, find the I'm first sticker. Um, I have one on my door, I've seen them on doors all over campus, so that's really encouraging um, to be able to, to see that and to feel comfortable. And then other stress management strategies, <clears throat> exercise. So what I was trying to say earlier before I got too excited. Um, when we exercise, so think about when you are stressed, right? Think about that breathing and what that's like. You get kind of panicked, you get shallow breath, um, you get kind of you know, tense, okay? When we exercise, we can't naturally be tense at the same time as we're breathing. Okay, so when we exercise, we're doing kind of the opposite of the stress response. We have to inhale big, we have to exhale big. We have to really focus on our breathing, um, which helps to calm us down. It also helps us uh, to have endorphins and all this brain chemicals and all that fun stuff, um, but it can really help improve your mood and decrease your stress. <clears throat> Box breathing is another strategy I have. So these are just my strategies that I like to give out that I, well, not mine, I mean, you've, these are like a top four <laughs> every time you Google it, but um, box breathing is another one. So with box breathing, what you'll do is you'll inhale, and if you can just imagine in your head or you can draw with your finger um, a box, okay? So you inhale for four, you hold it for four, you exhale for four, and you hold it for four, okay? You guys wanna try that? All right, so we're gonna inhale, one, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, four, exhale slowly, two, three, four, hold it, three, four. And then you just keep going around until you feel good to stop, okay? Meditation is another thing that you can do. So the idea of meditation is that you try to clear your mind of everything you have going on in there um, and try not to focus on anything, which is a very difficult thing for a lot of people to do. Um, so meditation is really good having a guide to help you and there are many different apps out there or videos that can. I was gonna play this meditation video that I really love, but it has a lot, a lot of bad words in it. Um, <laughs> I will email it to you guys <laughs> so you can see it as well. Um, it's really awesome, but I probably shouldn't do this I'm on camera, so. Um, but I'll email it. So meditation uh, is, is really great. And then yoga is another strategy <clears throat> that really helps with stress management. And I started doing yoga like four years ago, I think, um, downtown and 
just the, the help that it, uh, it just really helped me with decreasing my stress and it was really um, great. And I'm, you know, not saying the handstands, all the warrior like back bends and all that. We don't need to do that for yoga. Um, you can do like a restorative yoga, which is really relaxing, okay? You guys know, I've done it with <laughs> the college relations department. Um, but since you guys are here, we're gonna do some yoga tonight. Sound good? It's chair yoga. So all you have to do is sit in your chair. It's really great. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to grab my chair and do it with you. OK. <clears throat> all right. So just get comfortable, OK? This is something you can do at your desk. But I want you to sit nice and tall, OK? Shoulders come back, chest is out, feet planted firmly on the floor. Your shoulders are stacked on top of your hips. I want you to inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Inhale as you lift your, lift your chest up and exhale as you relax your body. And just keep doing these big inhales and exhales. Just take a moment to calm yourself. Big inhale through your nose. Exhale, relax your body. Take one more big inhale. And this time when we exhale, we're gonna stretch out our neck a little bit. So we're going to exhale, drop our chin to our chest. Ear to shoulder, neck back, ear to shoulder. So big circles with your neck. As you inhale, you're dropping your chin to your chest. Exhale, your head is falling back. And just keep going. All right, one more big inhale this way. When you get to the top, I want you to reverse. So we've gotta go in the other direction. Nice and slow. If you find that you wanna stop in one particular area, feel free to do that. One more big inhale here. Coming back to the top. <clears throat> and take a big inhale. Make sure your chest is out, your back is straight, your shoulders are stacked on top of your hips. <laughs> I want you to take a big inhale, bring your arms up overhead. And exhale, bring those arms down. Inhale, arms come up overhead, reach for the ceiling. Exhale, release those hands back down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> lift your toes. Oh, sorry, lift your toes. <laughs> and lower your toe. I know. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> uh, so go ahead and lift your toes and drop your toes. Lift those toes up and put them back down. So inhale, bring those toes up. And I just want you to connect your breath with your movement. So as you inhale, bring those toes up. And as you exhale, slowly lower your toes back down. Feel yourself connecting with the floor. We'll stretch out our calves a little bit too. So now uh, raise your heels as you inhale. Drop your heels as you exhale. And just keep this up with your own breath. All right, go ahead and stop that. <clears throat> now, I need you to grab your arms behind you. And if you cannot, just grab onto the chair behind you. You're just gonna take a big inhale 
Chest up, and as you exhale, you're gonna try to bring your chest to your thighs. It's not about meeting your thighs, that's okay if you do not. It is the act of bending at the hips and feeling that stretch. Take a big inhale. As you exhale, try to go a little bit deeper into that stretch. One more big inhale here. Exhale, I want you to take your hands now and bring them down to the floor. So this is like a forward fold, but in your chair. So just let your hands kind of fall heavy to the ground and keep up that breathing. So take a big inhale and as you exhale, relax your body. Big inhale. Exhale, just let everything go. All the stresses, all the worries, don't even. <laughs> now take one more big inhale. And as you exhale, I want you to slowly begin to sit up. Very slowly. Feel your vertebrae stacking one on top of the other until you come back to the top. <laughs> Shoulders back, chest straight, hands on top of your thighs. <laughs> now I want you just for a minute to pause and think about how you feel after that. Maybe you feel a little bit more relaxed, maybe you don't, that's okay too. We're gonna take one big inhale, arms come up overhead. And I lied a big exhale. Okay. One more big inhale. Hands up at the top. We bring them down. And as you bow your head to your hands, I want you just to give yourself a little bit of gratitude for coming out in the rain to listen to me speak. Thank you. Um, for anything that you got through on this day, or maybe set an intention for yourself for the rest of the night, the rest of the week. <laughs> and namaste. That was chair yoga. Welcome. Um, <laughs> that was my presentation, but I will open it up for questions if anyone has any questions. <laughs> no, but I am group fit certified, so I think I can teach yoga. Um, <clears throat> I actually started teaching restorative yoga in my fitness class. So every other Friday, we uh, will swap out abs and we'll do restorative yoga. And I think it's really made a difference in some of my students, um, just being able to kind of stretch their bodies after a long week. Um, but just, you know, being able to show up on a Friday morning and, and relaxing. Um, Makes them feel good, yeah. But, but I love to teach yoga, so, you know. This isn't a question, oh. but I was gonna ask you to do that in your class of kids. When I was in a, a freshman, I had like a job exploration course, uh -huh. and the only thing that I remember from that is some of the stress management techniques. Nice. So I said it'll stick with your students for like 20 nice. years. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. I, um, so yoga's really interesting, because I, you know, you, it, ha it gets like this, kind of weird like reputation, right? That you have to eat granola and, and wear Birkenstocks and you know, all of that stuff. And it's actually just like, so for me, when I started teaching it, I, you know, I felt kind of goofy, like namaste, you know, and, and doing those things. But um, just to kind of be that person in the front of the class and allowing people to relax with it um, has really kind of benefited me um, in my personal growth and just, you know, being able to teach that stuff and being able to be comfortable. And I think that opens it up for students to relax as well. Um, you know, I'm the weird person in the front of the room, like, all right, go ahead and do this and be calm and listen to, you know, well, we listen to like good music, but, but yeah, so. I did go to a yoga conference once, and 
it was actually like a great experience. Like we all left there and everyone was just like glowing with relaxation. It was, I would highly recommend it for uh, anyone. So yeah, any other questions? Chair yoga is something that you can do obviously at your desk. Um, I've done it uh, at a conference or for a virtual conference, which was like a nice little break. And then um, I also do it for my health and wellness students too, instead of taking them out. It's like, hey, you know, you can just do it here. And we actually didn't even do all the poses. So another one is if you wanna do like a twist and just kind of stretch out your back a little bit. That is a really good one. Or bring your leg up while you're sitting, kind of stretch out your hips. Those are other things too. I saw some jeans, so I didn't, you know, want to make you guys do that. <laughs> but yeah. What's the <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> so that was one of the limitations is that I couldn't identify anyone over 23 plus. So, um, and then another uh, limitation with that was when I had them uh, say what year they were, it went freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, fifth year senior, post back and I didn't give anyone an opportunity to choose grad student, and that was kind of my bad in miscommunication, I guess, um, with how my survey was sent out, but yeah. So mostly juniors and seniors, though, and then a couple posts back, so that. Um, I know it's been a little while since you took the class, but what are some of the things I was most surprised by the fact that I got a, a decent sample and I had my correct effect size. I actually had a large effect size, which is like what we hope for. Um, and you know, honestly, I was like, oh, no students are gonna do this. I'm gonna have to like spend extra time and, and all that. But um, it was really great. I worked, so I did it here on campus, right? It was all anonymous, but um, IT services, Joby, she would just send out reminders every two weeks. And every time those reminders went out, you know, it was fresh in their memory and students would, would do more. So I was really pleased. I actually had 242 students like actually start to take it, and then it went down with who actually submitted it. So that was, that was pretty good, pretty good percentage. 2019, so fall 2019. So yeah, probably changed a little bit in the next year. Um, like I said, I, I submitted my dissertation and my uh, study for the journal on March 15th, and then I had a baby two weeks later, so. <laughs> Just one adventure to the next. <laughs> but no, it was, it was really cool. And you know, I, I like, now I'm involved with the Acha Nacha survey on campus. And so to be able to kind of dive deeper into those health topics with what our students are dealing with is really cool to see too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming. It means so much that you were here and you took the time. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah.